for affirmative action. So uh, those who are who are making an argument that affirmative action is a positive uh, thing for society to do um, would say that discrimination exists and it's hard to police uh, schools and, and employers and enforce laws. So it's important to um, affirmatively help underrepresented minorities in those contexts. Uh, it gives them incentives to attain higher education. You can even the playing fields for historically disadvantaged. We use that term with the UST all the time. This so socially and historically disadvantaged groups and can um, enable more qualified people to be hired of a talented group that's being ignored in employment opportunities. A great example of that is when law firms go to recruit at Howard Law School, they know that they are going to more likely get African American graduates and they can increase the diversity of the lawyers at their law firm. Okay, a couple other arguments is removing the stigma of the other. The philosopher John Stuart Mill has that quote you can read yourself. Um, and that you know, we talk about diversity uh, as well as being beneficial of, it, in a, of its own sake. Um, schools, you know, this is an opinion that I think many people share more civil rights practitioners. You probably get a better education in a school setting where you come, in, especially children, come into contact with people of a diverse background. Instead of talking about what Hanukkah is, you have students in your class, your child's class that are Jewish, and you can learn about that in addition to just in a classroom setting. Yeah. In Montgomery. In Montgomery. <laughs> Sorry, what? Yeah, exactly. They just they just um, yeah. Okay. yeah, they just took all the names off of the holidays. Oh my god. <laughs> I, did, I, I did hear about that. It's not this is yeah. long ago, but anyway, we can talk about that again if that is an issue. So some arguments against affirmative action. So if discrimination doesn't exist, that maybe um, organizations might hire less able workers because you're just hiring for the immutable characteristic. Of, of their race. And just to define race, right, immutable characteristics are characteristics that you cannot change. The way you appear to somebody else, that's what they're assigning to you. So you look at somebody and you say, you, you appear to be African American, you be, your, your color is black. All right, I don't know what I appear to most of you. My family is, is Hispanic, and my religion is that I'm Jewish. And I'm perfectly comfortable saying that out loud, but it's probably not a great idea for you to make assumptions or ask Others, if you, I, 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 that's something that my part of my identity that I share the same way that Ashley talked about using her as an example of what her um, physical appearance is. So when we talk about race, we talk about minority groups, I think it's important to distinguish those terms for both with religion, with ethnicity, and with race. And ethnicity would be cultural, uh, a similar cultural ties. So, all right, national origin. The more I part, you have a question? I'm just wondering, would you refer to yourself as Sephardic? Yes. So, uh, Jen's question was if I'm Sephardic, um, Jews that come from Spain and uh, North Africa and the Middle East are Sephardic Jews. Most Jews that passed away in the Holocaust are the other large category, which is Ashkenazi Jews. Those are Polish, Russian, German Jews. So, my family historically speaks of the hybrid of Spanish and Hebrew. And um, on my mom's side, Arabic because we are from Syria. Uh, so that's right, the dark eyes, right? <laughs> so, anyway, back to our arguments against affirmative action, right? Less, less qualified people to be hired. Um, incentive for minority workers to say, oh, I'll get a job regardless because I'm Hispanic, so I don't really need to work as hard. Um, a famous uh, Brown University uh, writer on this topic is Glenn Lori. He is an African American writer who basically doesn't like affirmative action at, because it creates racial stigma, there can be white resentment. Um, and the question that I'll leave open to us to talk about later if there's time is, is affirmative action still necessary with increases in minorities in the middle class and in enrollment rates in higher education? Okay, so I'm going to skip this slide just because it's a lot of pros in history. You can look at that later, but I just want to go back. Get to specifically higher education and a brief history of race conscious admissions. So, um, the seminal case here is the University of California versus Baki. Baki was a, a white medical student or a white male who applied to medical school, and at that time, the University of California Davis had two admissions tracks. 
the first trap, was the general admissions trap, and the second trap was to set aside six to 10, 100 seats for um, minorities. And that sounds like a quota, doesn't it? So the court decided that that plan violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. If you're not familiar with the 14th Amendment, it's at the bottom. It's basically um, any affirmative action case is litigated under the, uh, under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and this was more of the cult's court's holding. I love legally as far as the lawyers in the room. It's fun for the non lawyers It's like what you're talking about. Um, so I'm going to skip over what strict scrutiny is. Um, if you want to ask me about strict scrutiny later, we can talk about it. But the next case is really um, is the most recent one. So I'll just add as an aside, in 1978, when Baca was decided, Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman on the Supreme Court, said that she thought in 25 years they could re-examine what affirmative action looked like in higher education. And lo and behold, 78 plus 25 is 2003. So in 2003, two petitioners um, appealed to the court saying that they were denied admission because as applicants um, who were members of a of a majority, they, they were denied because of the point system at the University of Michigan. So the University of Michigan had a system that if you checked one of the underrepresented minority boxes, so a lot of times it's not Asian because Asians are overrepresented in higher education, but an underrepresented minority like African American or um, Hispanic, you automatically were awarded 20 points in the point scale of, of trying to get admitted to the school. So they filed suit, these two petitioners, alleging uh, discrimination of, uh, based on race and violation of the Equal Protection Clause and of Title VI, which we all are familiar with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, uh, no discrimination in uh, ins institutions that receive federal financial assistance like schools. Um, so the court held that this admissions plan was unconstitutional because the 20-point bonus undermined individual consideration. So the quotas were illegal 25 years earlier. This is this is too numerical, too rigid, too blunt of an instrument to say you're black, therefore you get 20 points extra. You're Hispanic, therefore you get 20 points extra. Um, and it precludes the individual consideration of other uh, of those individual characteristics. Um, the, the court consistently holds that schools do have a compelling interest in in, in um, attaining a diverse student body, but that they have to, the way that they get a diverse student body has to be more narrowed than the blunt instrument of 20 points for your race. Um, so the court found that the, these, these are some um, important points of the, what the court found, that um, the benefits of diversity are substantial, they break down racial stereotypes, they promote cross-racial understanding, they create lively, more spirited, and enlightened classrooms, they prepare students for a diverse workforce, and they prepare students for citizenship. Um, this, this narrow tailoring requirement means, as I alluded earlier, you, you can't use a quota. Race can't be a defining feature of the applicant's application, and that they have to look at workable race-neutral alternatives, um, and that it should also be periodically evaluated. So if you're, you know, spend 10 years in a certain way of admitting students, and you still only have 5% African Americans in the state of Alabama, and the large population of Alabama is much more, you know, has much higher percentage of students that are African American, your admissions policy might not, your, not be working to really diversify your university. Uh, are there any questions based on what I just said? I know I'm going kind of fast. Isn't that hard to prove that you may have hired someone based on I mean, yes, the answer to your question is yes. It is hard to prove. You hear a lot of the rumor mill. Right. Know, that the reason why, like you said, you hear, well, you only got hired, the person got hired because they was a minority. Or they, they were only accepted to school because they were a prior. I just wanted to um, point out that while the court said in the education context, diversity is a compelling interest, they have not said the same thing in the political context. So. <laughs> Our office might look a little different than other offices in the world, but that's not what this is 
Supreme Court has not ruled on that. Uh, so, how am I on time? Okay. 
few statistics to think about. Um, we are a very high, uh, segregated society still. We are um, a sadly segregated society in many ways. I think we forget that living in the District of Columbia, in Maryland, and Virginia. Or maybe we don't forget it because we see it in our communities. So um, these numbers are what they are. And then my last slide on statistics. The racial breakdown of college students who received college degrees 10 years ago. 70% were white, 8.7% were black, 6.3% were Hispanic, and 6.2% were Asian. And this is the one that bothers me the most, this last slide. I mean, this is my personal opinion, so I'm hoping I'm taking a little, a little leeway here. This last point, um, that 70, you know, three quarters of students at the most selected for your colleges and universities came from the top quarter socioeconomic status of the country, and 3% came from the bottom quarter. So if we talk about a country that has access to opportunity, access to education, access to social mobility, that, that number is my personal life's fight. Um, testing, I can read about that. And the last two slides are about this cartoon that I always look at and think about when people try to talk about justice versus equality. And so I'll just leave that cartoon out there for people to think about and answer any questions that anyone has. I think actually we have about five minutes on that. I actually wanted to open the floor for our last couple of minutes, whether it was specifically about your presentation or any of the others. If anyone have any questions on the other? Yeah, okay. I just wanted to um, follow up on Jennifer's presentation. Um, <laughs> We're working with ASCR and uh, OHRM, and we're also looking at whether OPM is going to issue a policy on the use of social media. But we get lots of questions all the time about whether supervisors should be doing background checks um, on applicants by searching social media, Googling somebody, seeing what's out there about them. And we also have had a lot of misconduct cases involving social media. So I think. Um, we need to get ahead of this, and I think we're going to be working on a department-wide policy, and hopefully we will um, be in line with any government-wide policy that's coming out. I'll work with you. Oh, I know. Okay. You're already on my list. All right. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Anything I said on the Excellent presentation, Leah. Um, in your analysis of the Supreme Court cases, the way the Department of Action, did you extrapolate any themes as to why the justices just will not accept affirmative action as a remedy of past discrimination? I mean, obviously, this starts hundreds and hundreds of years ago, um, and it certainly wasn't a race-neutral policy in place. Uh, then, uh, they're clinging to race neutral policies now. So I just, you know, in several cases, I'm not very familiar with all this. What is your take on their refusal to accept it as a remedy of past discrimination? And also, I love um, Sotomayor's dissent, and she great read. Yeah. I'll, I'll give a plug for Sotomayor's dissent as well. The first Latina on the Supreme Court, the first person of Hispanic origin on the Supreme Court. All right, Teresa, I am going to give this the answer as Layla talking and not on behalf of anybody else. Um, as a student of this topic, I will say that your answer is always going to look at Justice Kennedy, at least right now, right? He is the swing, he is the swing justice on the court. He has a lot of issues with white, worrying about white, resent, white resentment and reverse discrimination, if that's the term that you want to use. Uh, I personally despise that term um, because I don't, I, I, as we all can probably feel that there is no such thing as just reverse discrimination if you can discriminate against someone.